the Vestroyan Firstborn, are one of the oldest continuously operational military forces in the Imperium. In terms of the Imperial Guard or Astra Militarium, they are perhaps the oldest force. Unlike many worlds, we have a fair idea of their origins, not just as a military force in the galaxy, but of their homeworld itself and their great shame. The planet Vestroya was colonised at some point in the Age of Technology, when mankind first ventured into the stars to reap its rewards for successfully beating the Fermi Paradox. Its original colonists travelled far indeed, as the planet lies in the Halo Zone, past the Eye of Terror on the edge of the Milky Way galaxy in the Segmentum Obscurus. Which is interesting because the Eldar had an empire at the time and for some reason allowed the filthy Monkai to expand into their galaxy and colonise everything. Unless, that is, they were too busy powering up their degenerate god, that is, disgusting. Or, if you've read Priest of Mars, you realise that Golden Age humanity was OP as fuck. Like many Terran colonial efforts, they brought with them much of the flora and fauna from their homeworld, such as chemdogs, which are descended from the original canines that were brought with the colonists, lung spiders, and the common rat, which is probably one of the most popular species across the galaxy due to its alliance with humanity, in genetic terms. Not only that, but they clearly brought with them some kind of tree, because they use a lot of wood, but we'll get to that shortly. Oh, and there's clearly some kind of bear-like creature for all those fancy hats. This does mean that it is technically in the Imperium Nihilus, kind of but it also appears to have a fairly clear line of communication to the Calexis and Scarus sectors, and hence to the remnants of the Imperial positions around the Eye of Terror and the Segmentum Pacificus, leaving it in a slightly less dangerous situation than other worlds this side of Terra, where the Sisistrix Maledictum directly cuts them off from Terra and the Astronomicon. But don't worry about all that kind of thing, that interesting detail, because GW isn't. Primaris! Vestroya is an industrial world, a tithe designation granted to those planets which have a tremendous economic and, shocker, industrial output, but which are not quite at the turning point of being a fully-fledged forge world in their own right. So, though heavily industrialised with factorum and densely packed accommodation for its population or workforce, it is not so heavily built up or polluted by its productivity to be designated a hive world. You can breathe and walk around outside without dying instantly, and Vestroyans do see the sky, even if it is a bit smoggy. A bit like China. China! During the Age of Strife, the Mechanicum of Mars undertook its own period of expansion, reuniting Mars under the Martian priesthood, following Old Night and the Cybernetic Wars. They sent out vast colony ships across the galaxy. Due to the tumult of the warp during this period, these ships moved slowly through real space, but occasionally through the Immaterium in the rare moments of stability, to make short hops to speed up travel, similar to how the Tau utilise such short hops and skimming the surface of the Nightmare Realm to get where they want to go. They eventually settled on worlds and founded what would become Forge Worlds of the future on unpopulated planets with sufficient resources, or planets which had been or still were human worlds, no doubt taking advantage of information and data they had mapping the galaxy within their archives, from the human empire that was, that they had gathered on Mars and the Sol system in general, as they occasionally invaded Terra and other human settlements in search of technology and records that had survived the Great Calamity. In addition to settling the Forge Worlds, These Forge Worlds also expanded into pocket empires loyal to Mars, allying with other human worlds and civilizations in the vicinity, either ruling over them directly or trading with them as they needed to import resources inevitably to keep the Forge Fires going and continuing the Omnisire's work. These pocket empires held firm until the Great Crusade when the armies of the New Imperium, the Alliance of Terror and Mars, 
went forth and reconnected with these existing Martian holdings and their enormous industrial capacity, which went a long way to spurring the crusade onwards as each Ford world and its miniature empire was absorbed within the borders of mankind's new realm, thus allowing the supply lines to be significantly shorted, enabling humanity to push ever onwards. Convenient, that. Really makes you think, almost as if someone had a plan. Now, during the expansion of the Great Crusade, there was a certain amount of jockeying for influence and control of the various new territories and planets as they were made compliant. Between the various wings of the fledgling organs of the Imperium State, the best example of this is the status of the Night Worlds. Now, by no means all, but most of them fell under the influence of the Mechanicum and owe them fealty up to the current age. And in return for the Knights fighting for them, they share planetary resources and technology. This was not only a political victory. The Martian priesthood won, though, as when industrial or technologically advanced worlds were encountered, they often came under direct control, or indirect control, of Mars with the Emperor's agreement, obviously. One example of this is the planet of Kiavar, which the Primarch Korax agreed to become a fife of the Mechanicum, who then acted as overlords of the existing tech guild system on the world. Korax was a nice guy, even though he did nuke people. Something similar appears to have happened to Vestroya, which having an ancient connection to Mars during the Age of Strife, it was inevitable they would fall under the influence of the Red Planet. Now, this may go some way to explain what happened next. As the heresy broke out and brother for brother and worlds burned, the Vestroyans, under the influence of the Mechanicum on the planet, decided to wait the war out and see who won. They refused to raise and dispatch regiments from the planet to confront the traitors and instead kept its population on world, continuing to churn out arms and other goods from their vast manufactura, which they also refused to send the Emperor's armies. That's what the stories say anyway. There is some dispute due to the sources available and vast amounts of time that has passed since that age. Some tellings of the tale say that Vestroya stayed loyal and determined that they were better use to the Emperor's armies, keeping their population at work churning out war material. One of the other reasons for this may possibly have been the fact that being on the very edge of Imperial space, they may have only just been brought into compliance, you say just before the heresy began, which meant they had less devotion to the Imperial cause, a reasonable excuse to explain their motivations. Whatever the cause, and whatever the case, once Horus was slain, and the Great Scouring saw the battered Imperium reconquered by the vengeful Imperial armies, order began to be restored, as well as galactic governance and accounting. The Vestroyan leadership may have hoped that following the destruction of the heresy, they could get away with their refusal to send troops. That was not to be the case, however. Rebute Gilliman, effectively the ruler of the Imperium at this point, confronted the Vestroyans. The Tetrarchs, the rulers of Vestroya, at the behest of their people, negotiated a settlement where, to pay for their sin, which points to them probably standing back and watching, they agreed to the Primarch's harsh terms of tribute, essentially of their firstborn sons to the Emperor's armies in perpetuity, or when they were redeemed in the Emperor's eyes, which, considering he only has one left, is an unlikely prospect. This penance has continued for the last 10,000 years, unbroken, with some fighting formations and families being able to trace their lineage back to this dark day. Every firstborn son, and it is son, no matter what they may say otherwise, Vestroyan civilization would have collapsed within a century of this rule being instituted, if it were any other way. But that's a whole other issue that we'll discuss at a later date. Each firstborn son, either from the lowest hab to the mightiest noble villa, is given to the Emperor to fight and die in his endless wars to continue mankind's existence. The Vestroyans have a pretty low opinion of other Imperial Guard regiments which lack the lineage of their own. No other force in the armies of the Imperial Guard come close to the history of the Vestroyans, and their soldiers can rightly claim seniority to all of the fighting forces save those originating from Terra and Sol, and the oldest Astartes chapters. The Vestroyans are organised in the same manner as other regiments, 
as laid down when the Imperial Army was disbanded and reforged by Rebute Gilliman following the end of the Great Scaring. They are grouped in regiments, mostly infantry, although they can be rightly considered heavy and elite infantry compared to many of the rabbles recruited by the Minotaurum. The Vestroians primarily specialise in siege and urban warfare, although they are deployed, due to the top-rate bureaucratic skills of the Imperium, to other war zones where these skills have absolutely no utility. They have armoured regiments and other specialised forces, but in the main they are an infantry force, and a boon to any commander who has one assigned to his war zone. One of the unique features of the Vestroians is that their regiments are continuously replenished with reinforcements from their homeworld. This does cause a problem due to the vagaries of interstellar travel, meaning that a batch of new recruits could be in transit for years or decades before they reach their new home. The plus side is that the regiment is continually reinforced with new recruits, which have the benefit of joining veteran soldiers who can train and impart knowledge to them, meaning that the Vestroian fighting formations are always at a reasonable level of experience. This process is easier for Vestroians than it would be for other fighting formations, because generally the regiments that receive these new recruits are from the same families, meaning that cousins and uncles serve in the same formations, allowing for swifter bonding through familial connection. The Vestroians do, however, appear to make periodic visits back to the homeworld, particularly when it is under threat of invasion, of which there have been 18 so-called Great Wars so far, and the Imperium's recognition of what a loss to the Emperor's armies it would be if this prime recruitment world, as well as its industrial output, were lost. These visits can be decades and centuries apart, however, but they do give regiments the opportunity to re replenish their valuable and rare weaponry, as well as fill their ranks with new recruits. Also, you can see this as a morale-boosting experience for the population, to see their sons return home, for a time. A situation which is extremely rare for those who join the Guard. Vestroia is a heavily industrialised urban planet, with a frigid and cold environment, which creates hardy troops. Because of the nature of their recruitment, Vestroian firstborn are being trained continuously, and have been for 10,000 years meaning that their training techniques have been honed to a remarkable degree, and ensuring that the raw recruit is a skilled and knowledgeable soldier, imbued with the experience of a martial tradition near unmatched in the Imperium. This also means that when they do join their regiments, they are able to integrate faster and receive additional training from their veteran kinfolk. The Vestroians have an archaic look, in arms, equipment and uniform, which is reminiscent of those forces which fought in the Great Crusade. This is because their initial fighting forces, raised on Vestroia, came from that time and have remained in active service throughout. New regiments have been raised or others wiped out and refounded, but Vestroian soldiers have been serving for 10,000 years, so this has created a continuity of martial tradition that is only paralleled by some small number of other long-standing military forces within the Imperium, such as the Cadian Shock Troops, the Ultramar Auxilia, and the Terran First Armoured, to name but a few. All of these have changed with the times, so to speak, adopting the weaponry and equipment of the current day, which is generally utilitarian and standardised. Vestroia has not, because it is an industrial world which has always provided for its own soldiers itself, and not had to receive its equipment from the Munitorum, except in cases where the regiments are cut off from the supply lines. The Vestroian's uniform is that of the Crusade, mixed with their own cultural norms, with large hats and great coats displaying the symbols of the Imperium. They kind of sort of betrayed. Augmetics are in abundance and are a common sight amongst the Firstborn, ensuring their soldiers continue to fight where others would be removed from the front line? Many regiments of the Guard would not be granted this expense, but the Vestroians appear to act as a separate entity to the rest of the Guard, able to rely on their own long and extensive supply routes back to Vestroia, to provide them with expensive gear and supplies, as well as a continuous flow of reinforcement troops from the homeworld. Many of the Vestroians are using weaponry which has been passed down 
by their ancestors, as efforts are made to recover the war gear of the fallen and send it back to their families. Additionally, the Vestroians, because of their great age, have a vast amount of artifices on the planet, able to produce, to a reasonably accurate level, these ancient variants of weapons, to equip new firstborn with some of the best-made weaponry available to the Imperial Guard. They have tooled barrels and hand-carved stocks, from trees, presumably, which are often inlaid with gold and jewels, giving them a beauty which few but the wealthiest worlds can hope to match. Additionally, the use of ceremonial-looking daggers, which are far from ceremonial, sabres and axes is common, particularly among the officers, and these weapons are often of great antiquity. Uniquely, many officers wield weaponry with an axe integrated into it, much like a bayonet would be, but obviously requiring a different form of combat, although the line troopers themselves still make use of bayonets. It is not just their LAS rifles which have a beautiful finish, but their heavy and special weapons, being handcrafted as well. And all these weapons are built or maintained on Vestroya, using their 10,000 years of experience to give a local flavour lacking from many other regiments. This goes for their armoured forces as well. For instance, the Bane Blade of the legendary Vostroyan tank commander Demetrian, whose interior is covered in etchings and whole friezes of artwork. Because of their appearance, they speak to the people of the Imperium and represent a vision of what the glory of the Imperium is, as if they are heroes from the past, walking in the present, looking like the warriors who once fought at the Emperor's side. Because of their great length of service, they have fought across the Imperium in many of its major campaigns. The Vestroians at the end of the 41st millennium were active across the galaxy, in nearly all major war fronts. Three notable areas, however, stand out. The fall of Medusa was a vast military campaign undertaken to evacuate the world of Medusa V from a rapidly expanding warp anomaly, which drew in nearly every foe the Imperium has, together with elements from nearly every wing of the Imperium itself. Without getting too in-depth, Medusa V is in the Segmentum Ultima, or was, sat on the edge of, and to be frank, the only reason it was founded was as a way station or supply depot for ships attempting to use the Devil Slingshot, which was a warp anomaly which allowed ships to make a warp jump, which would take years in weeks or months. It was named in honour of the Iron Snakes chapter, which had originally overseen the defence of this world, or the two worlds originally, during its colonisation. Now, that warp anomaly was expanding, and in hindsight, this was most likely as a result of the nefarious plans of Abaddon the Despoiler to create the Sisistrix Maledictum. All would die on the planet, and the Imperium actually decided that was a bad thing, and something should be done. A large Vestroian contingent under Lord Marshal Graf Harazain, who would be the overall Imperial commander for the campaign, fought a holding action against the Xenos. And when I say that, I mean pretty much every single kind of Xenos in the galaxy, as well as traitors, to evacuate the people of Medusa, which they succeeded in doing. Vestroians had a heavy presence in the Ultima Segmentum, despite it being on the other side of the galaxy, and they would be more effective operating closer to home, and perhaps the Eye of Terror, but it makes as much sense as anything else these days. Vigilus! Whatever the logical reasons for their presence... They would be a constant throw faced by the Tau Empire, which was continuing to subvert or simply conquer new worlds. On Medusa V, they had been present and countered by the Firstborn. The same would occur on the world of Nimbosa, where the Vestroians were one of the only Imperial forces with the strength to resist the advancing Tau Third Sphere expansion efforts, which took advantage of the Imperium shipping out most of, well, pretty much almost all the garrison forces there, to counter the advancing high fleets. The Vestroyan 1st born 9th Regiment under General Graf Tushenko fortified the city of Polia, where they attempted to hold out, but after counter-attacking the crew to Xilia, they were cut off and massacred at the Colif Gorge Massacre by the superior Tau forces led by one Commander Brightsword. This 
noble sacrifice led to the Nimbosa campaign, which eventually saw the reconquest of the planet. The 9th, however, was apparently reformed pretty quickly, somehow, and dispatched to fight the Tyranids, where it was wiped out again in conflict with High Fleet Moloch. They held the Hive city of Karak Prime for 18 months, until, overrun, they detonated its nucleonic stacks, depriving this splinter high fleet of organic matter, which caused it to starve and die as the winter descended upon the world. The Vestroyans, much more understandably, are active in the Calexis sector, which is relatively close to Vestroya, and a sector riven with invasions from Xenos and chaotic forces, as well as rebellion. The 55th Vestroyan firstborn under Colonel Alexandrov, a cousin of the current ruling Tetrarchs of Vestroya, has been active on the planet Kulf, with the regiment playing a dance of attack and counterattack against the rebels of the Severin Dominant and the Orc forces on the world, with none of them having the strength to hold off each other and requiring continuous attack and retreat. The soldiers now run sweepstakes as to where they will be deployed next. The 1054th Vestroyan Firstborn, known as the Voitrikes, are a legendary force within the Firstborn. Uniquely, they have become a Void Warfare and Siege Force, as they are in general used to take Spaceborn facilities, fortresses and ships. They were not originally intended for this, and why would they be? But the Munitorum, in its wisdom, which some whisper is guided by the will of the Emperor himself, were deployed as a normal siege regiment equipped for ground warfare to take the fortified void station of a rebel governor, despite not being equipped for void warfare or trained for it at all. Anyways, somehow they managed to uh, take this fortified void station, suffering heavy casualties in the process. Through a process of survival of the fittest, the diminished regiment had become expert at void warfare, and from then on have been a dedicated force used to take star forts and space stations. They have taken to making unique modifications to their equipment, such as their uniforms, which they have turned into pressurised suits because of, you know, space, and their weaponry, which is designed for ground warfare, like in an atmosphere. On paper, they are a normal siege regiment, which has led to problems with their deployment, as the Munitorum can't seem to work out what to do with them, and its scribes don't have the full understanding of the nature of the conflicts they are being deployed to. This has created an extremely adaptable and flexible force from all of the terrible deployments they have been forced to endure, which have generally been inappropriate to their armament and experience, such as subterranean mining worlds, aerial assaults on ocean planets, and attacks on forge worlds. Despite this odd history, which appears at this point to be a sick joke from some Terran bureaucrat, the 1054th has overcome them all when they should have been wiped out. They have become a separate force spread out in company strength across the Imperium, with these companies rarely coming into contact with each other and often receiving severely out of date orders. They still receive reinforcements from Vestroya, somehow, but due to their separate nature it can take decades of transit for troops to reach their designated unit. This has made the 1054th pretty self-reliant out of necessity and they often trade with the Imperial Navy and other regiments for equipment and supplies. They have been in the Calixis sector for several centuries, and a large contingent of the Voitrikes is currently sieging the Starfort Lycurgus, commanded by the Severin dominant general Frederic Constantine. As Cadia fell and the Imperium was sundered in two by the Great Rift, the Vestroyans appear to have gotten off rather lightly, being relatively self-sustaining, and also being in the one end of the galaxy which was not actually affected by these terrible events, at least not directly, as they are behind the Eye of Terror, so to speak, if one looks from Terror. This edge zone is no doubt going to be, in the future, an important part of the Imperium, as it is not afflicted by the tyrannic invasions, nor the subversive expansion of the Tau, being the other side of the galaxy nor subject to an influx of chaos forces which appear to have driven towards the Segmentum Solar or are wreaking havoc in the cut-off side of the Imperium Nihilus. This is a strong point, and one which must be held, so Vestroya will no doubt play a major part in this.
Thanks for watching everybody. Please give the video a like if you wouldn't mind. If you're not subscribed, please do subscribe and let me know in the comments below what you thought. Thank you to everybody supporting the channel. You should see your names here. It means a lot that you guys do continue to support the channel. Really appreciate it, seriously. And if anyone would like to join them, please use the links below. Uh, I'm on Patreon or you can become a YouTube channel member. Also, Filthy Shell. I've started using this Brave browser, which seems pretty good if you're concerned about like privacy and stuff like this. But it also gives you uh, a little bit of a kickback money-wise if you use it because uh, it's something to do with the advertising. But basically, they, they send you a little check every month for all the web pages you view. You gain like a percentage of the advertising and stuff. Anyway, use my link below if you want to try that out. No obligation. It seems fine to me though, but you know, whatever. Anyway, more videos coming up soon. Thank you all again. Really means a lot to everybody supporting. And like I say, if you could, uh, if you could subscribe, like, and share if possible. And yeah, I'll see you again next time. Cheers.